Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of the Chemical Technology Advisory Board meeting for academic year uh, 2022 to 2023. Uh, so if you're watching this video, this format is a little different than the previous one. And this format is all about our equipment, all about our laboratory facilities. What do we provide training to students on and how does that relate to your company? And we want to make sure that we are upholding what you need in terms of an employee employee to standard. So that way when graduates leave our program and hopefully go to work for you, they have all of the training and the experience and at least some lecture and some basic training where they can start with your laboratory facility uh, without any problems or issues at all. So this video is all about the instrumentation here. So I first want to talk about our high performance thin layer chromatography. So a lot of us are very accustomed to high performance liquid chromatography but this is our high performance thin layer chromatography uh, that we're mentioning here. And we have partnered up, we've been very lucky to partner up with KMAG, uh, located in Wilmington, and uh, we have a working relationship with them where some of our students go to KMAG and actually work in method development and method creation. Uh, and in exchange with that, we thought that why couldn't we do this on our campus? So KMAG decided to install a loaner HP TLC system in our laboratory environment. And now students in our program are getting trained on it. Interns that are working for KMAG, well, they don't even have to leave campus now. They can do some of those activities in-house. Uh, and it's a win-win relationship for all of us. So we do not own this equipment. KMAG is still the owner of the equipment, but they have installed it in our lab space and we are taking advantage of it. So this has opened up a whole nother realm um, of education and training and experience that our students might receive uh, when they graduate from our program. So what you're seeing up here, um, our instrument does have a uh, TLC auto sampler as well as an automatic developer that will develop the plates. Uh, we have a automatic visualizer that takes the images and saves them to the computer software. Uh, there's also a scanner in place uh, that can do a little bit of quantitative work for us if we want to go that route with uh, thin layer chromatography now. Um, and we do have a developing tank, uh, derivatizer, and so forth. Uh, so the full-blown system... Uh, and uh, for those of you in the pharmaceutical world, especially, uh, you are already seeing HP TLC being mentioned in the USP. So we are pulling monographs already. Uh, we are adapting them into our program, especially ones that do focus on HP TLC. And students are using this instrument more and more and more. So this could not be possible without KMAC Scientific. And we want to give them a thanks uh, for all of their support that they have done for us throughout the past uh, really two years now. Uh, next up is our gas chromatography. And by the way, this is probably the only community college in the state that provides training on HP TLC. Um, if there is another community college that's out there in the state that provides this training to their students, I would love to know who they are because I would like to touch base with them. But I guarantee you Cape Fear Community College is the only one that provides this training to their students. Uh, next up is gas chromatography. Uh, so what do we have on the gas chromatography side of the house? Well, we have a number of different things. Things. And I want to start at the bottom of the list first. And the bottom of that list is a Agilent Headspace GCFID system. Uh, this unit was donated by Quality Chemical Laboratories many years ago, uh, and it really introduced us and opened us up to the world of Headspace because at that time we did not have Headspace capability. So again, we want to thank our local employers because without their help, uh, some of this would never be possible. Uh, so the Headspace system began to get integrated within our program and uh, now we're at a point where that Agilent system is just almost out of commission. So with that said, this past academic year in the equipment hearing, the college approved us for a new HP um, or sorry, a new GC system. Uh, but this one's coming from Shimatsu. Shimatsu we've already uh, had really good dealings with before. They've always given us really good deals, academic discounts versus someone like Agilent or Waters and so forth. Uh, so Shimatsu's always treated us very well. Uh, and that Shimatsu system you're seeing on the screen, it will be a Headspace system, GC, FID capability with a hydrogen generator and air generator in-house. Uh, 
So no more tanks that we've got to deal with. Uh, however, in addition to that, we already have a Shimatsu GC TCD. We also have a Shimatsu GCMS. And on that Shimatsu GCMS, we also have a Purge and Trap Concentrator, PTC. So this allows us to do things like THMs in drinking water and our academic program. Uh, so students get a little bit of variety pack of GC systems. Um, and I think that we represent pretty much the mainstream chunks of GC that's out there. With the exception of those few uh, detectors that you're not seeing on the screen, I think the concept of gas chromatography, different detectors that can play into the field, as well as purge and trap and headspace, we represent every one of those uh, facets of gas chromatography world. Uh, next up is high performance liquid chromatography. Uh, what does our laboratory provide training on to students? Uh, uh, well, we have a number of HPTLC or HPLC systems, and our very first HPLC system started with Shimatsu many, many years back, and that was a Shimatsu LC20 series. We never really had Agilents in our house up until that point, and the reason is because Agilents were so expensive, and sometimes they were twenty or 30000 more dollars than what Shimatsu could offer. So again, we've never really dealt with Agilent, but you are seeing Agilents on the screen, and the reason is because uh, some of these Agilent systems were donated again, and once more, they were donated by Quality Chemical Laboratories. So again, thank you for that donation. We have put those to work, uh, and what we got out of those donations uh, was an HPLC system with a UV Viz detector, and there was a quantity of two of those. Um, now, before that, we had a used HPLC system that we purchased used from a local supplier, and that Agilent uh, system was a refractive index um, system or detector. So we have HP, LC, UV. Uh, we have a total of three of those, actually. And we have an HP, LC, RI system uh, that our students use. And when I say use, I don't just mean bring samples and put them on the auto sampler tray. With all of this equipment, we talk about how to break apart the pieces and how to put the pieces back together, how to change out the consumables, how to change out all of the supplies that need to be changed on a routine basis. I often say it's like taking your car to get an oil change, and that is what we teach our students in our instrumentation courses. All right, so uh, four Agilent systems. The problem here, though, is that every one of these at this point, they are very old folks. Um, you know, th these have been around for quite some time, probably since 2010, maybe even before. And our LC systems are getting older and older. And because of that, they are starting to fail more and more often. Uh, this past academic year alone, we have had a number of different failures where even though we had four systems in our house that should have been working. Uh, they're just failing left and right, whether it's the software, whether it's the computer, whether it's the pump, whether it's the detector. And it's just really hard to maintain all four working at one time because there's so many problems with them due to age. Uh, so this I'll mention a little bit later in the video, but HPLC systems, we have a total of four that shoot students share. Uh, ion chromatography, we're still staying in the chromatography world. Uh, we do have ion chromatographs in our uh, laboratory facility. We have a total of two, uh, and those are from Metrome. So one Metrome is actually dedicated to cation analysis, and the other um, Metrome system is dedicated to anion analysis. Now, I know that these can be interchanged, uh, but that causes a problem in an academic type of environment. So we like the dedication of an instrument for a purpose, and that saves us as users from changing out the tubes and changing out the columns and changing out the suppressor lines all the time. Uh, so for that reason, these instruments are ready to go whenever we need them to actually be used for whatever type of laboratory experiment that we're getting our students to do. So two systems of Metrome, they both have auto samplers. Uh, I will go back and say that all of our HPLC systems have auto samplers as well, and all of our GC systems have auto samplers as well. Uh, next 
Next up, we are venturing into the spectroscopy world, uh, and this is going to uh, come across a ultraviolet visible uh, spectrometers, and we have three of these from uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Uh, so these are equipped with carousels. They actually allow a student to, um, you know, uh, place multiple samples at one time, up to five and a blank uh, that can be analyzed in one run. Uh, and in addition to that, they are not standalones. They are computer software controlled as well, uh, just like our IC systems, our GC systems, and our HPLC systems. Uh, up next is infrared spectroscopy. Uh, we do have that technology in our laboratory facility as well. Uh, the vendor that we've chosen here for FTIR for the longest amount of time has been Shimatsu yet again. Uh, and we have two of these uh, IR affinity models from Shimatsu. Uh, one of these is the kind of very basic, what you would see as you were in academics of loading samples up on salt plates and that kind of thing. And we also have an ATR attachment as well. So that ATR allows our students to process samples much faster, a little bit easier. Sure, it's more expensive, but again, we have two systems that are very similar. One is very basic, more is an upgrade, so students can see the differences in these models and how they operate and behave in a laboratory environment. Uh, so uh, there's our FTIR systems uh, that students use mainly, um, you know, in all of our classes, depending on what kind of lab experiments that we're doing. Uh, up next is our atomic absorption spectrometers. So we have two atomic absorption spectrometers. Uh, these both are actually the same model, just a different logo in the top corner. We ordered one many years ago, and that was a Varian system that we've had, uh, probably lingering around since 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. Uh, up next, our newest addition uh, to the club is the Agilent system because they bought out Varian in terms of the atomic absorption, and they rarely change the model or the way this thing looked. Uh, so a new Agilent system is on its way. Both of these are 240 FS systems. Uh, so if you take a look at the picture, you'll actually see four bulbs that are installed on the atomic absorption spectrometer. Uh, this allows our students to do uh, multiple uh, metal analysis in one run, which makes it way more convenient and faster to process data. And in addition to that, we can also uh, select the combination bulbs that will do more than one metal analysis at one time, and we can um, up the ante as far as our metal analysis goes. Not just four metals that can be analyzed, but maybe up to 10 metals can be analyzed in one run, in one sample at one time across the board. So uh, two AA... Uh, S or really AE systems as well. We teach students how to convert this machine over from the absorption side of the house and use it as an emission as well. So AA and AE is represented. Uh, next is total organic carbon analyzer. Um, so what we've chosen here is probably what a lo lot of local laboratories are using, and that's, that is a Shimatsu system TOC. Um, our TOC instrument does have an auto sampler as well, and it is connected to computer and software. So students are learning how to enter batches in, uh, quality control samples included in those batches, uh, how to go through the gambit of setting up a method, running a method, processing the data, just like they do in all of the other equipment that you've seen so far, as well as upcoming equipment that you've yet to see. Uh, next is a polarimeter. So uh, we've got one automated polarimeter in-house. Uh, we had one TOC in the house as well. The automated polarimeter is a ruled off research polarimeter uh, with a stainless steel loading cell. So students uh, basically load samples through the stainless steel compartment, very hard to break or to damage. We did that for a reason because we don't know how they're going to handle them. We hope they handle them with respect. Uh, but a uh, very automated system of measuring optical activity uh, and then calculating specific rotation and that type of thing. Uh, up next is our density meters. Uh, so we also have automated density meters from Rudolph Research. Uh, it's just a very quick way for students to do density through the use of equipment and not necessarily the pycnometer methods uh, like you would often see in something like USP methods or uh, maybe some of the environmental methods. Uh, but it is a simple injection uh, and it has actually an internal screen video on it that you can actually view your sample getting loaded into the sample chamber uh, just to ensure that there's no air bubbles or anything that should not be there that might impact your density or a specific gravity readout. Uh, we also have automated melting point systems. 
These automated melting point systems students use very often, especially in the monograph testing or when they synthesize products in the laboratory to check the purity of them. These melting point systems uh, come from Mettler Toledo. And what we like about these is that it puts some automation onto the melting points and students don't have to sit there and watch crystals melt with their own eyeballs using something like a microscope lens. Uh, these also have internal uh, video feeds where students can actually activate this and they can not squint their eyeballs but look at a video screen that's showing up on the viewfinder uh, and they can watch those crystals melt in real time if they want. It also records the melting process so if students walk away they can come back and they can replay the actual visual of these crystals melting. Uh, so that way if they miss out on it and they do want to go back and take a look at these crystals uh, when they go to the liquid state, they're more than welcome to do that and it will show them the temperature at the time that they begin to melt and when they finish melting. So melting points and melting ranges this system will provide our students. Up next is our distillation and disintegration baths. Uh, you know, this started, uh, I would say, a handful of years ago. We always did dissolution, but we did dissolution a very poor man's way, and that's using a beaker and a stir plate and just some automatic pipetting that comes out of the uh, the one liter beaker that we were using. But now because of very generous donations, again from Quality Chemical Laboratory and Alchemy, we were able to implement actual real dissolution systems in our lab. Uh, so what you're seeing here is just the um, uh, systems that the Quality Chemical Laboratory uh, group uh, donated to us. It was a total of two, and then Alchemy donated a total of three. So right now we've got a total of five dissolution baths uh, uh, that our students will use throughout many classes, not just throughout one, but many classes that we use the solution in. Uh, and uh, these are mostly six vessel systems. Um, the two in the back we've kept open, but they're typically six vessel systems for all five dissolution baths. And we have them all operational and they still work and they work beautifully. So again, Alchemy and QCL, thank you very much because without that, our students would not even see or probably hear of the word dissolution. Uh, but now they get to use it, they get to work with it, and they get to kind of go through all of that process. We also have disintegration systems, maybe not the fanciest disintegration systems, systems, but they do kind of what disintegration is meant to do. Does that pill break apart? Yes or no. So the disintegration systems we've actually just ordered through this cheap, uh, probably no name supplier. I think we actually found these on Amazon for less than a thousand dollars a piece. And we have two systems like this that are three chambers, and we have another system that's two chambers. Uh, and uh, those disintegration systems uh, come out very easily for us and our students. They're very basic. They're very simple. Not a lot involved in them, but they at least go through the disintegration testing as well. So a total of three disintegration systems, uh, two three vats, and then the other one is a two vat. Next up is an automated titrator. Uh, our laboratory facility does have automated titration. And uh, we still do titration by hand, though. I never really want you to forget that. We still go through the motions of getting students very comfortable with titrations. We see it everywhere. We see it in the environmental world. We see it, of course, in the pharmaceutical world. We see it embedded in all of the monographs that we're pulling and that we're implementing in our laboratories. So titration is never going to go away. And hand titrations are very important to give students training on. However, we do have metrome titrandos that are more automated, more convenient. Uh, students get to break up the monotony of uh, titration. And uh, the metrome titrators have been around now for probably 10 years or more at least uh, in our lab facility. Uh, in addition to that, a couple of years ago, we stuck with metrome and we also obtained some Carl Fisher titrators. Uh, we have a quantity of two of these. Um, and uh, once more, we use these in everything from the food chemistry course that we offer offer to the pharmaceutical course that we offer uh, and everything else in between. Uh, so um, the Carl Fishers are getting more and more used as time goes on and on, but they've only been adapted for about two years for us at this point. 
Uh, DNA and biotechnology, we do a little bit of, not much, a, a lot of what we do and a lot of our equipment focuses on the chemical analysis part of a laboratory, uh, but we do provide students a little bit of small training on things like PCR and electrophoresis. So our, our PCR system, you know, students will prep samples, they'll undergo the PCR thermal analysis, they'll go back hours later, take them out and so forth, and the electrophoresis chambers, it's again, and just the basics. What is electrophoresis? How does it work? What's its purpose? And so forth. And what you're not seeing on here um, are the electrophoresis chambers that we have as well for SDS page. Uh, so we do have vertical chambers as well as horizontal chambers. Uh, and we do a little bit of each one of those in our program. We just don't focus on it a lot because we focus more, again, on the chemical analysis side of the house. Uh, general items that we can talk about here. Uh, just this past Last year alone, ACA was a savior in uh, donating a lot of basic laboratory equipment to us, and you're seeing the list over on the left-hand side. Uh, everything from rockers and stirs and chillers and water baths and grinders and hot plates and overhead mixers and rollers and rotary evaporators. I mean, they literally came with two truck bed loads of stuff that our students uh, help them uh, unload, put on uh, carts and pallets and then take them up to our laboratory where we then unbox them and set them up in our laboratory. Uh, so thank you, Aka, for those donations. Uh, probably after one week that they were in our lab, they were already getting used, uh, and this helped improve the basic laboratory supplies of what our students use on a daily basis. So again, thank you very much. Over $100,000 worth of supplies were donated that day, and all of these items are currently still sold on ICA's website. So again, thank you very much. Uh, other general items that we can talk about, muffled furnaces. We do have uh, technology to do muffle furnaces and residues and ignitions uh, that uh, you would often see in a laboratory environment. They are very small. They can hold maybe like one crucible at a time. Uh, but, you know, as far as what we need for demonstration purposes and getting students to process small sample batches, then these are perfectly okay. We didn't need anything um, really too much larger. So both of these are neighbor th therm muffle furnaces. They can go up to, I think, 1400 degrees uh, and uh, that's perfectly suitable for what we need to use those for. Uh, refractometers, we also have automated refractometers as well that students use for again many purposes in many classrooms and many classes that they take. Uh, we have a total of two of these. Uh, we still use the old refractometers. We train students on how to use those first. I think again that's very important for them to look through the little microscope eyepiece and align up the dark and light areas and focus in on it and then flip the button down in order to get that reading themselves. Uh, but the refractometers that are more digital, more automated, uh, we do have those in our lab and students eventually use those after we give them training on some of the older models that are not automated. Rotary evaporators, uh, we have a total of three of these. All of them are for ICA. Uh, these three rotary evaporators we use from everything from uh, synthesis, when students do that, to get products, to distill solvents off. Uh, we also use them for our own purposes to maybe uh, simple distill over, uh, you know, large batches of solvents that we are using for completely different purposes, just to save on chemical waste, and we can reuse those solvents a little bit later after we check the purities of them. So rotary evaporators, two or three, uh, actually in our lab facility right now. Uh, drying ovens, we went through a period where we got rid of some of our older uh, drying ovens in our main wet laboratory lab, and we shifted them to other laboratory spaces that we manage on campus. Uh, in our main working lab, uh, we chose to go with these Fisher Scientific Isotemp ovens. They allow us to control these ovens a little bit more uh, and uh, temperature-wise, and it makes it way more convenient when we start looking at heating methods and so forth that have strict temperature guidelines that we've got to abide by. So those older ovens do not do that. They're are just really glassware drying ovens. These are glassware drying ovens as well, but we do more of our temperature type of setting laboratory experiments using these isotemps that you're seeing on the screen. 
analytical balances we also updated a few years ago. Uh, we have a total of five of these balances that each have their own receipt printers. Uh, so these were the newest edition of the balances for us. And then prior to that, we also had eight of these Denver balances that also had receipt printers. So we do make students go through the motion of printing out receipts, making sure that they are putting those in their lab reports or laboratory notebooks when they write them, just as a form of proof that they did what they say that they did. Uh, so whenever we can get balances that have receipt printers on them, that's the way that we're going to go because that's almost like industry standard in the way or a preferred industry standard. Uh, up next are our incubators. We have a total of three of these smaller versions of incubators. We just don't use incubators a lot, but there are times uh, like total coliform tests that we do do uh, where we need incubators for. So we do have that option. Students do use them. Again, though, that's more biotechnology side of the house, uh, and we just don't find ourselves using these on a daily basis. But that's okay. We've got the capability of that if we need them. Uh, magnetic stirs. We found a problem with our magnetic stirs that we had we were popping outlets because sometimes depending on the size of the class our students would plug in all their hot plates and their stir plates and everything else in between and we were popping breakers uh, so we decided to start going this route of multiple uh, stir plates uh, or at least a larger stir plate that can uh, do multiple samples at one time so that saved uh, a lot of the load that we were seeing on our outlets uh, throughout the main laboratory workbench spaces so we have a total of three of these plus Plus, Ica, again, just donated uh, probably, I would say, five more of these that we have scattered throughout our laboratory spaces. Uh, vernier equipment, um, you know, I know that this is not really industry tailored, uh, but the vernier equipment we do like to talk about because the vernier equipment is all about portability. Uh, these are portable GC systems. Yes, I did say that. They're portable GC systems. They are portable AE systems. There's portable UV systems. There's portable colorimeters, there's portable pH meters and dissolved oxygen meters, uh, turbidity meters. Uh, we probably have over $100,000 worth of vernier equipment that can all be packed up into a suitcase and taken out into the field, and we can gather soil samples, we can gather water samples, and so forth, and do testing on the spot if that's what we want to do with some of this lab equipment. Also, uh, we provide high school students in the area um, access to any of this vernier equipment. So if they want to borrow this from us, we will go deliver it to those high school classrooms. They will integrate that into their classroom kind of learning topics or laboratory experiments that they want to do. And then they call us up and we'll go back and we'll pick that portable lab equipment back up from them and bring it back to our main Chemtech laboratory space. Uh, so all in total, we have about a million dollars running total, 1.1 million worth of equipment in our laboratory facility that students will receive training on throughout their two-year experience with us. And I think at this moment, we highlight the biggest chunks of each field that you might see that's needed in a laboratory environment. HPLC, GC, IC, and HPTLC in our chromatography class for sure, or our spectroscopy class for, or chromatography, I'm sorry. And then UV and FTIR and mass spectroscopy, uh, AAAE, are all represented in our spectroscopy class. So $1.1 million worth of stuff, and many of this could not happen without the help and support from you and our local industry supporters that are in Wilmington, uh, New Hanover, Pender County areas. So again, thank you very much. Uh, some of this is also not possible without the help of a few grants that we have obtained, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. But the grant money uh, has also helped support our equipment needs in the past, and we hope that we can continue uh, to be a player, especially in the National Science Foundation world uh, to obtain more equipment and get even better suited to meet your needs for an employee. Uh, as far as program highlights go, uh, what can we say about the Chemtech program? Well, first off, we're the only Chemtech program in the entire state. You're actually not going to see another one of us within the 58 community college that spread it across the state of North Carolina. 
Uh, and uh, Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte areas tend to be uh, very well suited for our students and our graduates once they leave. We encourage them to stay here, but the ones that grow up here don't want to stay here, it seems like, and they want to move out and they want to go across country. Um, we have had students that have branched off, though. Um, our students have went everywhere from Texas, Louisiana, Ohio, California, uh, you name it. We have had students that just spread across the United States in the 15 years that I've been here and managing the program and overseeing it. Um, are probably one of the more successful stories that we've just recently obtained or that we were uh, brought aware of uh, is one of our past graduates from probably six years ago uh, went to Ohio to get a bachelor's degree in chemistry, and now she's actually working for Harvard uh, as a researcher for one of their labs, and she's pursuing a PhD. So, uh, you know, our students go anywhere and everywhere, not just maybe directly into the workforce, but if they do want to transfer, they can transfer if they wish. Uh, Chemtech County by state, if you take a look at the area of North Carolina, uh, you're seeing quite a bit of uh, green areas that are showing up here. And those are counties that have reported a need for a chemical technician or someone with at least a two-year background in laboratory training or instrumentation training. So I think that the need for North Carolina is here. I think that's not going to go away. And it's our job to produce these graduates that can go out and work for these companies. Uh, I mentioned National Science. Science Foundation grants and the Burroughs Welcome Fund grant is also one that we've received in the past, I would say, five years or so. Our first NSF grant started in 2010. This created a water study project that we used our ion chromatography systems as well as our gas chromatography mass spectroscopy system for. And that GCMS and the IC systems are still used today. It's the same machines that we purchased back in 2010, and they are still working wonders for us right now. Uh, so uh, we have continued to do the water study, maybe not as large of a scale as we were doing when we were funded under this grant project but we still do open up that drinking water study uh, for faculty, staff, friends, and family, and so forth. We just don't advertise it, you know, countywide anymore like we were doing. Uh, that was a $150,000 grant that lasted for two years, which was the maximum at the time. 2014, uh, we were able to get our hands on a Burroughs Welcome Fund grant, uh, and they um, supported our endeavor in creating this uh, high school uh, competition called the Chemtechathon uh, that we ran with for about five years in total. So the Burroughs Welcome Fund actually supported this for three of those years, uh, and this concerned uh, a couple of things, but the major thing was the students and the teachers that they had really participated in a semester long long research projects. So these high school students came up with their own topic, their own idea of what they wanted to do. We told them that uh, we needed them to pick out topics that would interest the public. Uh, so that way, when they share their results, the public would take an interest in what they were doing. And these people came up with wonderful ideas. And some of those ideas actually stayed with our program for years later after the fact. So for instance, one semester, uh, a high school group talked about uh, how can we compare the different hotnesses of hot sauces. Um, and of course, that's through capsaicin and HP. LC technology. So our students uh, brought in random hot sauces and peppers and extracted the capsaicin from them and analyzed these samples on HPLC. Uh, we provided the training, they did their data analysis, and that laboratory procedure actually was integrated into our chromatography class uh, the next year after that high school group proved that it could be done and it stayed around for years later after the fact. Uh, what was nice about this is that these high school teams actually received a stipend um, or a money allowance and they told us what their needs were as a high school laboratory. And whether that was graduate cylinders or beakers or pipettes, whatever they wanted, uh, we ordered it for them and we had it shipped to their high schools. So they got free consumables and supplies if they did win this competition. So that went over again for around three years. Uh, we had about 20 volunteers every year in order to make this competition go forward. Uh, so we like to thank those volunteers and maybe you were some of those those volunteers. And if so, we want to thank you again. And the competition targeted about 80 to 85 students 
each and every year. Uh, by the time we looked at all of the high schools, and there were around seven to eight on average uh, participating high schools each of those years, student teams were around 10 or so students, give or take a little bit. Uh, we were serving 80, 85, 90 students a year, depending on what year that it was. In 2016, we received another National Science Foundation grant, uh, and this particular grant was for three years, and it totaled $405,000. It was actually the largest grant that a faculty member had received at that time at Cape Fear Community College. Uh, so this particular grant did a couple of things. Number one, it extended the Comtechathon competition with some major modifications. It initiated what we called the UPIC program, and the UPIC program was the Vernier program that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, that UPIC program was all about these teachers um, kind of checking out this portable equipment, integrating it into their laboratory teaching methods, and then returning it back once they were finished. And it also created a program liaison. And the program liaison's purpose was just to simply go out and recruit students for our program and recruit employers that maybe had no idea what our program was all about or that an option like this was for them and their future employees uh, as far as their jobs and job requirements go. Uh, so that lasted uh, for three years and it was extended with a no cost extension in 2019. And then in 2020, we also got word that another National Science Foundation grant was awarded and this one was $485,000. So once again, we topped our previous total and that then became the largest grant of a faculty member by Cape Fear Community College. So once more, we're very lucky to have the support of the National Science Foundation. Uh, the CT Mergers Grant did a couple of things different than the previous one did. Uh, first, it continued this program liaison and it just expanded that role and it targeted different areas that we wanted that role to take on. And no longer were we focused on New Hanover and Pender County anymore. We were now focused on statewide measures. How can we reach out and network and, um, you know, get in contact with some of these big employers in Charlotte and Raleigh and these other areas within the state. They have no clue that we exist. They have no clue that our students, um, actually the training and the education that they bring to the table and the purpose of the liaison is to bring awareness to those employers that uh, this is a viable option for them um, if they just take it seriously. Uh, second was to create a high school student and a teacher uh, chemical technology camp. So in the summer, mainly, uh, we see a group of teachers. Uh, we've seen two groups of them now, two cohorts of about 10 high school students or 10 high school teachers apiece. And we've just kind of brought awareness about our program to them as well. Uh, they were able to do a little bit of organic synthesis in our lab. They were able to work on some equipment in our lab, uh, run HPLC, run GC, do TLC, and so forth. And what we discovered is that many of these teachers did not have that education prior to this experience. Uh, most of them kind of are on the education side, not what I would say true bachelor's or master's degree candidates in actually chemistry or a related field. And if they were it had been a while since they were able to run samples on equipment. So it was a nice refresher for those of ones that have seen it before. Uh, the high school student camp, uh, this past year we served around 30 students. Um, and then the previous year before that was like after COVID. And we had around 10 students that started with us there. Uh, it was structured to be 20 students per summer. And uh, within those 20 students, um, you know, I think that we've averaged out our target student population as far as the grant's concerned. And then number three, which is probably one of the more important things that this project um, really implemented, was a paid internship program for our students at Quality Chemical Laboratories in Wilmington. So we were able to partner with QCL uh, and they agreed to take some of the trainers that they have uh, at their site location and use them almost as internship leaders. 
And each fall and spring semester, we would provide a group of students uh, that was getting ready to graduate. So second year students in our program to QCL. And QCL would undergo their kind of typical, what I would call training measures that they would do for new employees. And this gave QCL trainers uh, a little bit of temperature as far as the water goes with our students and what they know and what they don't know and which ones would make really good fits with their company and which ones would not. And what we found is that some of these students, they really liked and they probably offered them jobs before they graduated. And then some of the students, they realized that, well, they're not really a fit for us. So we're actually not going to waste our time or the students time either in pretending that they might be a good fit for us. So they kind of knew going into this, the batch or the crop of students that were getting ready to graduate and which ones actually would streamline into their company much better than others. Uh, and then at the same time, students realize, well, this is not for me, and this is as important as any of the other findings that we were discovering. So maybe they don't want to work for a pharmaceutical-related company. Maybe they just didn't like their experience. Maybe they didn't like the types of testing that they were doing, and they wanted to go a different route. So that's as important as everything else as well. All right, so a little bit about our um, grant activities that is somewhat equipment related and a little bit about the capability of our um, um, chemical technology laboratory facility in case you have not been on campus and seen it for quite some time. So there's a couple of questions that we would like to raise with you as advisory board members about what you just kind of seen on your screen and heard me babble about for the past 40 minutes. And these questions are up here and I want you to start thinking about these. So um, Sean A. Liendo, who is going to be reaching out uh, to you um, and maybe kind of talking and touching base about some of these ideas. Um, this is what she will be asking when she does visit you or when you visit her on campus. Uh, and question number one is after reviewing this capability, now that you've seen what we've got and some of the equipment that we have and manage, um, what equipment needs do we need in the future? Was there something here that you did not see? Was there something that you use on a daily basis that we did not have in-house? And for the environmental folks, I'm probably going to say that your first thing is like an ICP system. Well, that is true, and we know this, but this is something that you can still bring up and have those conversations with her because we need advisory feedback and we need advisory uh, suggestions on what to do going forward. And without those, that's a we don't have justification to kind of ask for things like an ICP. We need that in writing first. Um, maybe the pharmaceutical world, you're looking at this and saying, well, you had HPLC, but you didn't have HPLC mass spec. Well, no, we don't. Uh, so again, we need justification. We need reasonings. We, we need that to originate from the advisory board before we go forward and ask for this really high dollar kind of expensive piece of equipment. Um, and why is it needed? That's also something that we need to justify as well. Uh, number two is our current equipment inventory suitable for a two-year program. So I want you to take a look at the equipment, um, what we provide training on, uh, what our students get to use and get to experience. And I want you to understand that it's not just load samples up on the machine. They really do take them apart, put them back together, change out the consumables, change out the supply. I mean, they are totally hands-on. We are not just telling them to load things up on an auto sampler and we take it and we run it and give them the data back. That is not how our process works. They do it themselves. So in general, as a whole right now, are you happy with what we are providing our students? Again, is there something that is just drastically missing that we need to integrate into our program? And if so, we need to do it now and we need to do it fast. Number three, any specifics concerning equipment training that you want the program to focus on? So I know that for years we kept talking about, you know, hey, we get this... Um, uh, GC mass spec system and our students are using the GC mass spec system and we show them the inner workings of a mass spec and a little bit of theory of how this goes on and maybe again some of the things that can be easily replaced by a user or exchanged by a user. So we go through that process with them. But 
what we realized is that there was a need and some of this need was like a system suitability test. I mean, that's one of the things that was brought up, especially with people at uh, Quality Chemical Laboratory. Are you doing any system suitability test on these? Are you making students kind of prove that the instrument is suitable for the test that they're getting ready to do? Uh, and the answer was no at that time. We were not. We were just getting them to process samples. They would load them up on an auto sampler. They would go and then kind of start the software up, get their data kind of generated, print the data off and do calibration curves and everything else. But we did not stress the importance of a system suitability test. Uh, and that is something that we are now changing and that's something that we have now implemented within our program. So there's going to be more and more of that. And I think that would help please the folks at Quality Chemical and maybe at Alchemy too, because system suitability, you know, if you were a four-year uh, grad with a BS degree or a master's degree or maybe just a PhD. Maybe you have never heard of system suitability, but our students within two years are getting acquainted with system suitability now, and they can leave and graduate and go into an employer workforce and know what that is all about. Uh, number four, this is going to be a kind of um, a highlight here for the video and we are in need for more HPLC systems. Um, I've already mentioned that we have four, but one was ordered way back in like 2010, and the other three were donated units that we have had, and then another company has used those prior to that point, and they have some age on them as well, and they're starting to fail, and they're starting to, to kind of go out of service. So we're in need, desperate need, of more HPLCs. Uh, college funding is limited. Uh, you know, the past quotes that I've received here with Shimatsu and Agilent Systems, you know, we're looking at about $60,000 a piece or even more, depending on the vendor. Uh, and this is just really difficult money for the college to kind of come up with at one time, especially because we need more than one. Uh, so maybe scratch your head, maybe um, have this conversation with uh, Shawnee about what can we do as a program and what can we do as an advisory board to help ensure that new HPLC technology is coming into our laboratory. Uh, we want something that's pretty standard, uh, industry standard at least. We want something that students are actually going to see when they go and work. That does not necessarily mean the same brand, but that means that uh, it's got to be very similar to what they would see in a laboratory. So uh, how can we get a hold of those? We have requested or will be requesting one of these uh, in the upcoming equipment hearing, but again, that could be declined. And if it's declined, we'll just try again. But in the meantime, is there something that we can do to get our hands on more HPLC systems? Uh, number five, uh, I don't want to be a beggar, but again, you see what the power of donations can do to our program. Without the donations of ICA, uh, the recent donations, uh, a lot of our m kind of basic laboratory equipment, it was old. It was starting to fail. It was starting to go out of service. And we have a limited budget because we're a college. We're not really a company. Uh, so um, donations are always appreciated. They're always welcomed. Uh, dissolution and disintegration, look at what happened. Alchemy and Quality Chemical donated some dissolution and disintegration systems for us, and those dissolution systems opened up an entire new world for us as a program and allowed us to implement teaching methods that we could not do up until that point. And then finally, take, think about number six. Number six are partnerships are welcomed. You know, this is a two-way street and partnerships are are always welcomed and we would love to kind of hear your feedback and your ideas. And again, take a look at what KMAG did. KMAG had a need and that need, they were method developing on their side, method validation on their side, and they wanted some extra hands to kind of help them do that. And those extra hands were our students uh, who maybe were in their first year or second year of studies. It didn't really matter to them, but they were allowed to um, participate in this KMAG opportunity and KMAG brought the HP TLC instrument in our laboratory facility, hooked it up, 
Uh, and then we took off running. So interns are working for KMAG. KMAG is getting some extra hands to go to a common goal or a project that they want on their end. And then we were able to integrate that instrumentation into our program so all students could become more aware of something like high performance thin layer chromatography. Again, that was something that was not able to be accomplished. Uh, and this started just really a year and a half ago. Uh, so once more, thank you again. Uh, so if you need to reach out to me at any point, uh, feel free to do so. I mean, that's why I'm here, right? Uh, so my contact information is up on the screen. You'll see my email. It's my first initial and last name, tholbrook at cfcc.edu. My phone number is also there as well, 910-362-7168. So if you need to get a hold of me, please feel free to do so. Um, I would love your suggestions. I would love your input. Uh, and then Shawnee, who's our program liaison, will also be reaching out to each one of you, and she will uh, kind of lead this discussion in those questions that you saw on the previous screen. Uh, so what do we need in order to improve from here? Uh, what is an upcoming area that you are seeing in industry that we need to make sure that we have represented? Um, and even lab experiments, right? Are there methods or are there procedures that you are doing in-house over and over and over and over that is very common that you would like for potential graduates to know about before they apply to your company? Uh, so that's something else, again, that we need to think about as well. So not just instrumentation, but laboratory procedures that involve that instrumentation. Is there something there that we are missing or that you would like to bring to our attention? All right, so the way that these meetings will work, Shawnee will touch base with you about these. It's not a big issue. Uh, Shawnee could schedule individual meetings with you and come out to your location and just sit down and have a discussion. Uh, if you wanted to bring more people at the table when Shawnee does a site visit, uh, such as your laboratory managers or your HR people or maybe you know some other just common employees that would like to be filled in on the loop, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Uh, or if you would like to visit our campus, Shawnee could set up a meeting here. Uh, if more than one of you want to visit the campus from different employers and you want a smaller group meeting, that's also a possibility as well. Shawnee can help set that up too. And then if you want a tour of our lab facility, just to kind of see what we have and what we are operating with and, and really just kind of what our classroom settings look like, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Just touch base with Shawnee, reach out to her, she will reach out to you, and we can make those types of things happen. All right, so six questions. What should our current trend be? Number two is what we have okay as far as standards go or what you would like to see with an employee. Number three, anything specific on the equipment that you would like more of these graduates to know about. Number four, how can we get our hands on more HPLC systems? Number five, donations whether it's through equipment donations, whether it's through scholarships, whether it's through a fiscal donation that is going to be applied toward equipment purchases, doesn't really matter. Brainstorm on those. And number six, partnerships. Is your company interested in partnering with us to do some type of project where we can kind of wrap our students and our program and your company and together into one nice pretty package, All right? Okay, so once again, thank you very much for sitting here through close to an hour on some equipment overview with the chemical technology program at Cape Fear Community College. Um, I think that we're very unique and uh, you're not going to find someone like us or a program like us uh, throughout the entire state of North Carolina. So uh, I like to uh, think of our program as a two-year uh, miniature analytical chemistry program that flies under the name of chemical technology because that's really what this is all about. It's lab processing, instrumentation, quantification, and qualification. Uh, so um, again, if you've got questions, you want to reach out to me at any point in time, there's my contact information. I would love to hear from you and thank you for watching this video and serving on our advisory board. It means a great deal to us and without your leadership and without your suggestions and without your opinions, uh, who knows where the program would be. Uh, this takes a group effort. It's not just me. It's not just our lab technicians.
friends and the faculty and staff at Cape Fear Community College. Uh, it is uh, all of us, right? It, it, it takes a group uh, in order to make sure that our students get the best quality education that they can within the two years that they experience with us. So thank you again, and uh, feel free to reach out at any time.